good Monday morning of the 24th uh, week of the year. Uh, the letters today, the letter today is from 1 Corinthians and Luke, it's gospel. These are great texts. Uh, they really are. And, and I don't mean in a fun way either. You can see the life of the church and the, the convolution, the, the conflicts within it. This isn't a bunch of piety. These guys are struggling with their faith and struggling with the nature of the church herself. Sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, some of us who grew up in the 40s and the 50s may have thought that there was always this beautiful harmony. Hell, what? there was none. And it wasn't the Reformation. It went on all the way through. They were feuding and fussing and everything else. It's a very divinely human church that God writes well with it, writes straight as the genius, of the, as God's genius. <laughs> we do our best to make a mess of it. But listen to what he said. It's a letter to the Corinthians. Corinthians were very smart people, but they were also tough. They lived on the edge. Corinth is a sea town, as I understand it, okay? And they were tough critters, but they were also, there was a center of learning that, and uh, Athens, so they're no slouches. But they were tough, and they feuded with each other. So listen to what he says. Get for a little meat on this thing. He says, brothers and sisters, in giving this instruction, I do not praise the fact that your meetings are doing more harm than good. They're fighting with each other. Think about it. First of all, I hear that when you meet as a church, there are divisions among you. And to a degree, I believe it. There have to be factions among you in order that also those who are approved among you may become known. Now, I don't understand that one, okay? When you meet in one place then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own supper. And one goes hungry while another gets drunk. You're hardly celebrating the Eucharist. You're, you're simply looking out for yourselves. Don't you have houses in which you can eat and drink? Why are you doing it in the, in the common church? You know, the church, as it were, see? Or do you show contempt for the church of God? Make those who have nothing feel ashamed. You got winners and losers in the church. Then you don't think that that's true, even now. Come on. Come on. How many people, when they come to the church, feel like outsiders to the ladies' guild, the men's club, this thing, that thing, huh? Not intentionally. No one's being excluded. But there's insiders and outsiders. You, you know what I'm saying? It's normal, but it's bad. It's feuding. It, it's potentially feuding within the church. See? So he goes on and he says, uh, Do you not have houses in which you can eat and drink? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and make those who have nothing feel ashamed? What can I say to you? Shall I praise you? Forget about it. In this matter, I don't praise you. Now, watch what happens. This is a theological claim. He's going he's gonna to here present the Eucharist. So I think even St. Paul, when he's writing, he pulls this in. Okay, watch what he says. For I, for I received from the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, then the night he was betrayed, handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and gave it, uh, and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And where's the consecration? In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this often as you drink, as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. That's a formula. It's a creedal formula. And the writer here, St. Paul, pops that in there, okay? All right. It's not the same style of writing that went before and follows it. So what he did is he brought the, the Eucharistic prayer to the very center of this conversation. He, yeah, I don't know how else to put it. He gives you that profound theological reality of what is the church in prayer, what is the Eucharist, see, the divine meal. And he's contrasting that dramatically with the meal, the general meal, meal that they're having in which there is divisiveness. There's the haves and the have-nots. See, isn't that interesting? See? 
he puts in the words of consecration right smack dab in the middle of his argument with them, saying, this is the Eucharist. This is what we come together for, to eat the body and blood and drink the blood, the body of Christ and eat the blood of, drink the blood of Christ. Not to feud with each other or whether we, in terms of the general whatever, festa, okay? When we come to worship, we come to worship the one body of Christ, the blood of the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the life of the church, Christ. See? Yeah. Even though you might be feuding outside, not with the Eucharist, you're not. There's no place for feuding. See? No divisiveness. We come together in the one body and the one blood of Christ. I think that's true. You know, I know it's true. I mean, what am I to say? But I think in the life of the church, the life of the community, I think in my own passionate life, the monastery life, etc. You got human nature, and you're going to get divisiveness. You're going to get competition. You're going to get humanity in spades. But you also have the Eucharist. You also have that which unites us absolutely in in a most radical way to Christ the unity of the body of Christ himself. That's the Eucharist. That's the church. In its deepest level, the church is the body of Christ in the world. You see? It doesn't take away from the skirmishes. Look at St. Paul's writing. <laughs> they must have been going at each other. And he reminds them that we are the body of Christ. And we eat at the table of the Lord the body of Christ, then we drink the blood of Christ. You see. I think for myself, I, I, I love the church, and I love her humanity, and I'm not scandalized by her fleshiness. I'm not. Maybe the monastery taught me that. You see the holy in the ordinary, and you see sometimes that even things that don't seem all that right somehow still embrace the gospel in a beautiful way, in a special way. There is nothing as beautiful or more beautiful than to see redemption, to see a heart healed from its sins. There is something beautiful about that. And in the life of the community, something special when there's healing between people, a healing in the community of what was a feud before. I think that what I learned as a passionist was to see Christ in the flesh of the church. I just said that to you. I really mean that. I was so naively and simplistic when I joined the order as a 1959, I was 18 years old. And I expected to see a kind of perfect holiness and a, a simplicity in holiness. Uh, uh, I don't know the right word for it. And what I found was the flesh of the church. But I saw it in a very holy and sacred way. I told you when I was in what they call first philosophy, I was, it was, I was already in the outfit three years, right after the bishop. I was stationed in Hartford, and we were doing philosophy. And Hartford was a monastery in the woods. And so, whatever. It was the same place to have the monks that, well, let's say, uh, tended to hit the bars. There was no bars in our area. Whatever. It's just a true story. And I remember seeing one of our men was really, my father used to say stunato. It's when you bang your head against the wall because he had been drunk. And it was, it was in that way very visible that he had been drinking. And it was very easy for a young man like me, right out of the novitiate, naive, pious, actually thought I was holy, seeing a man who was a drunk. And I remember one of our faculty members, one of the passionists, was Neil Sharkey, whoever, and if you want to know who it was, was Neil Sharkey. And Neil said to us, because it was obvious this fellow had a drinking problem, it was obvious he was drunk when he came into the dining room, the refectory, even though in dead silence he stumbled his way in. And he said, that man has been in the order 50 years and he's persevered all this time. I hope you do the same. I never forgot those words. As broken as he was, he still persevered. He still was a priest. He still was a passionist who suffered from a disease but remained faithful to his vocation. 
He wasn't innocent. He was holy. And I think of him. He died that year, actually. And I remember him when I visit the Hartford Monastery, that's where he's buried. And I don't see a man who was a drunk. I see a man who was holy. That's the truth. You can give innocence to babies. Redemption is fleshy. I saw and experienced in him redemption. A humility before Christ. That's a truth. I'm grateful for the men I have lived with. And then most especially maybe the men who are broken by whatever, but who persevered. They were holy men. I was blessed and graced to have lived with them.